good afternoon. Uh, welcome all. As the scientific coordinator of the Center for Philosophy of Science at the, uh, the University of Lisbon, it is my great pleasure to open the, this May, the May session of the permanent uh, seminar of the center. Today's speaker will be Daniela Malanini. Daniela joined our research center in 2017 as an FCT researcher with a project disclosing the role of visual reasoning and mathematic diagrams in scientific explanation. And in September 2020, he got the position of uh, principal researcher with his uh, res uh, research project exploring the weak objectivity of mathematical knowledge. Daniele has been publishing several papers in some of the best journals in philosophy of science, such as the Journal for General Philosophy of Science, Synthes, and the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science this year, 2021. 20, 20, uh, I want to thank Daniele for having, uh, for having accepted our invitation to this session. And it is a great pleasure to have you at uh, our permanent seminar. So, Sylvia, the digital floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, João. Thank you, Daniele, for accepting the invitation. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, I think that most of you already know the rules of this, of this seminar. Um, Daniele will speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then we will open the Q&A session that will be moderated by me. And during the Q&A, you can all raise your hand or you just type your name in the chat and then I will call you. Um, we are recording the, the presentation uh, as in the previous sessions, but we will stop the recording uh, as soon as the presentation finishes. So uh, for the Q&A, there will be no recording so you can feel it easy to ask all your questions. That's all. So Daniele, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Silvia. Thank you, Joao. It's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> my pleasure to participate in this, uh, uh, in this uh, seminar uh, session. And uh, well, let me start from the title, okay? Uh, why from the title? Because uh, when, I, uh, when I first uh, sent Silvia the title of this uh, presentation, actually Silvia asked me, are you moving to philosophy of mind? <laughs> and, my answer was no, 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 no. <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still in philosophy of science, still working uh, at this interface between philosophy of science, philosophy of mathematics. Uh, let me explain in a very general way uh, the uh, the content of uh, of today's talk. So here you have a quotation uh, from uh, this book by uh, Raviel Nets and William Noel, The Archimedes Codex. Actually, this is uh, uh, a book for the general public, but uh, uh, Raviel Nets, uh, together with other uh, important historians of mathematics, they made the new edition of uh, this important codex by Archimedes, which is the Palimpsest. And in the Palimpsest, there is also one treatise, which is called The Methods, The Methods to Eratosthenes. Uh, we will see something about this uh, uh, method, this treatise, and in particular, one proposition, which will be central. But the point here is that uh, this magic of mind over matter refers to the use of pure mathematics in physics which of course uh, is something that, uh, well, you know how it works, okay? You have done uh, mathematical physics, so you have already experienced this magic of mind over matter. But there is also another magic, which is the magic of mind, of matter, sorry, over mind, which is physics applied in mathematics. And this is something that we find in Archimedes, as you will see. I will give you a very, very quick example of this uh, matter over mind magic. Now, the first kind of magic, which is magic of mind over matter, is, uh, is a topic which is very hot, actually, in contemporary philosophy of science. And 
Probably you have uh, already seen this topic uh, under uh, another name, which is the applicability of mathematics in the empirical sciences. So what is the issue? What is the philosophical issue when we apply mathematics in the empirical sciences? Well, according to uh, a very, very wide, uh, widespread view, uh, mathematical entities, they are, uh, they are not causally effect, uh, effective. They, <clears throat> they do not have a special temporal location. So they are distinct from uh, the empirical entities of the empirical sciences. And when I say empirical sciences, uh, what I, I have in mind uh, is natural and social sciences. These are the empirical sciences. Okay. Of course, mathematics is science. Okay. So the issue, the philosophical issue is how can we account for the fact that mathematics successfully applies in the empirical sciences? Okay. And of course, this, uh, this question, behind this question, there is the idea that there is a metaphysical gap. Okay, the metaphysical gap uh, stems from considering the objects of mathematics as these abstract objects which lack uh, causal efficacy and spatial temporal location. And on the other hand, the, uh, the entities of the empirical sciences. They match very well, uh, this match works. How can we account for this, uh, uh, for this success? Okay. Now, this is a problem, uh, and actually, if you want, I can send you, uh, with Marco Panza, we wrote a, a, a paper on, a, on the historical development of, uh, of uh, this uh, philosophical problem. Uh, if you want, I can send you the paper, but the origins, the, well, not the origins, the very early reflections, philosophical reflections on this problem, can be traced back at least, at least to the uh, Pythagorean school of the sixth century before Christ. And in particular, there are some actors like Philolaus of Croton um, and uh, other uh, uh, Pythagoreans. And these guys, uh, they try to uh, account for the fact that you, successfully apply uh, arithmetic uh, uh, in harmonic, which is the science of uh, intervals, okay? Uh, they try to account for this success in terms of a metaphysical doctrine that probably you know better than me. More recently, there have been uh, other attempts to account for this uh, uh, success. And here you have some uh, references, uh, Mark Steiner, uh, Chris Pincock, uh, uh, notably Ottavio Bueno and Mark Colivan with what is, uh, what is being called the inferential account of applicability of mathematics in science in terms of model theory. So very complicated stuff there. Um, and also some, some more recent accounts like this one by uh, McCulloch Ben. Okay. Now, um, that is the, uh, the uh, mind over matter magic. Okay. Uh, actually, this problem, uh, the problem of accounting for the success of mathematics in science, I claim it is only only an aspect of a more general problem, which we may call the general problem of applicability. The general problem of applicability is the problem of accounting for the successful interaction between the empirical sciences and mathematics. So when I say that uh, the problem of the applicability of mathematics in the empirical science sciences is just an aspect of the problem. Of course, I'm saying that there is something more to that, to the general problem of applicability. Actually, uh, this something more has remained unexplored until now. Uh, why? Well, 
because philosophers uh, generally uh, conflate the general problem of applicability with the problem of uh, accounting for the successful uh, application of mathematics in the empirical sciences. So th that is the reason why uh, even in, in some surveys on applicability, uh, when you read applicability problem, they are uh, referring to this problem of accounting for the success of mathematics in the empirical sciences, okay? So they conflate the two. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is not the right way to, uh, to go. Why? Because there is this other aspect, which will be a matter of our mind magic, which has remained unexplored. And I think that it is important to have a look at this, uh, at this uh, um, part of the general problem of applicability. I introduce a terminology here. So I'm calling uh, these successful applications of mathematics in the empirical sciences direct applications, okay? And the problem that stems from these uh, direct applications is the direct applicability problem, which is the problem of accounting for the success of mathematics in the empirical sciences. But again, there is also, also another aspect, which is a matter of our mind magic. So there are also, and I claim, uh, applications, successful applications of the empirical sciences in mathematics. And I call these applications converse applications. Therefore, there is another problem that we have to face here, which is the converse applicability problem. The problem of accounting for the su success or effectiveness of the empirical sciences in mathematics. This means that if I'm right, successful applicability runs both ways. So not only from the direction of mathematics to the direction of the empirical sciences, but also the other way around, from the empirical sciences to mathematics, okay? And I want to convince you that there are, there are, uh, there exist converse applications. And I want to give you two examples of this application, okay? The first one is taken from Archimedes, from his treatise Methods, and it has to do with the first proposition of the treatise, proposition one, okay? In that proposition, Archimedes finds the following proposition, mathematical proposition. Uh, Please observe that I'm not using proving. I'm not saying that Archimedes is proving that proposition. It is finding the proposition. And if you want, we will discuss this point later. So an application of what? An application of the law of the lever that is found uh, by Archimedes uh, uh, in his treatise on the equilibrium of planes, which is is mechanical uh, treatise that, well, it's not the only one. There is also another treatise on levers, which is lost, but this is the, the famous uh, mechanical work by Archimedes. And the law of the lever is, is used in geometry as to find this mathematical proposition, which says that the area of a parabolic segment, we are going to see what a parabolic segment is, is four thirds of the area of the triangle, which is enclosed in the parabolic segment. And then a second ex example, I want to give you an example of uh, uh, an application of uh, electric, electric circuit theory <laughs> in number theory to find what? To find a mathematical proposition again. And the mat mathematical proposition in question is the arithmetic mean is greater than or equal to the harmonic mean. So this is an inequality 
Okay. So let's start. Well, well, first of all, let me say something about uh, uh, the kind of examples that I, I, I've chosen. I, I have more examples, uh, but I, uh, I have chosen these examples because in the first one, you have an application of mechanics in geometry. In the second one, you have an application of electric circuit theory, which is not mechanics. So it is another branch of physics that I'm using in mathematics in, in number theory. So uh, um, when we, uh, we talk about uh, uh, applications of, um, of physics uh, in, uh, or uh, more generally applications of empirical sciences in mathematics, uh, well, if I take into consideration only geometry, as it is made in the first case, and an objection uh, would be, well, okay, but if geometry has something to do with mechanics, then you are not applying physics in mathematics. You are applying physics in physics. If you endorse this view that geometry, at least Euclidean geometry, because remember that we are in the context of Archimedes uh, treatise. So we are talking about Euclidean geometry, of course. So the objection would be, well, you are not applying uh, an empirical science in mathematics. You are applying an empirical science uh, in physics, okay? Because for me, geometry is physics, okay? That would be a way to, but with the second ex example, I'm showing you that there are also cases in which an empirical science is applied in pure mathematics, okay? Which is number theory in this case, okay? So there are also applications of the empirical sciences and I will focus on application of physics in, in number theory. Okay, so let's start from the first example, the Archimedes case. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to give you all the details of Archimedes treatment, mathematical treatment in, uh, in the methods. Uh, why? Well, uh, it, it will be very long, actually. If you want, I, I can send you uh, I can send you a summary of the proof. Well, it's not really a summary. It is the proof given by Archimedes. But what I want to do in the next slides is to show you how the law of the lever, which comes from mechanics, is applied in the geometrical treatment. So I will use some uh, mathematics from uh, Archimedes, uh, Archimedes uh, book, of course, but I want to focus on this particular uh, uh, application, okay? Now, uh, the proposition in question is proposition one of the method, which says that any segment of a parabola is four thirds of the triangle, which has the same base and equal height. Okay, this, this is what Archimedes says. First of all, what is a parabolic segment? Well, you have a parabola, for instance, in, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this diagram, uh, the parab parabola is gamma, okay? So you cut the parabola with, uh, with a line, uh, you get line segments in this figure, the line, line segment is AC, okay? And the region bounded by the parabola and this line segment AC is your parabolic segment, okay? So the, the, green, the green zone in this figure. Uh, now, there is another, uh, uh, another important detail here. Uh, how do you get uh, uh, the triangle uh, inscribed in uh, this uh, uh, parabolic segment? Well, of course, you already have points A and C, which are the extremes of the line segments. So you have to, uh, to pick, you have to choose uh, uh, another point to trace your triangle. The other point is B and it is found 
by drawing, Archimedes says, the parallel to the axis, which is the dotted line, the dashed line in figure, the axis of the parabola. And this line, it passes through point D, okay? Point D is the middle point of AC. So you trace a line uh, DB, okay, which is parallel to the axis of the parabola and you find point B. And what the proposition one says is that the area of the parabolic segments of the green zone there is four thirds of the triangle ABC. Okay, this is the proposition. Now, uh, of course, we also need the law of the lever. And probably you remember this law from high school, or <laughs> I don't know, from your uh, studies. So uh, the law of the lever is found by Archimedes in this treatise on the equilibrium of planes. It is proposition uh, six and seven. Uh, it is, uh, first of all, found in proposition six. Six and then in proposition seven, uh, it is generalized to uh, 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 magnitudes which are not commensurable, but th this is not important to us. So the law of the lever says that two magnitudes balance at distances which are reciprocally proportional, proportional to the magnitudes. Okay. Now, Probably you have seen the law in a more uh, modern uh, fashion, which is if you take uh, a lever, uh, which is the red uh, line in my, uh, my story uh, drawing, uh, you take a lever, you have a fulcrum, which is K in this uh, drawing. Now you place two masses, M1, M2, on the arms of this lever. <clears throat> you consider the distances from the masses to the fulcrum, which are D1 and D2. And what the law of the lever says is that M1 and M2 are in equilibrium. They balance just in case the following proportion holds, which is D1 is to D2 as M2 is to M1. And you can see the reciprocal proportion here. So you have D1 is to D2 as M2 is to M1. And of course, if you want to state that, uh, state there, uh, that, sorry, uh, in uh, a more uh, up-to-date terminology, you can use fractions. We can use, use fractions and you can say that M1 over D2 uh, equals uh, M2 over D1. So th this is the condition that gives you equilibrium, okay? Now let's see how Archimedes uh, applies this uh, law in geometry. Uh, here you, you can see this uh, already developed uh, uh, diagram. As I told you, I'm not going uh, to give you all the mathematical details of the proof. But consider that at this point, at this point, Archimedes has found the following relation, the following proportion between what? Between some line segments of the figure that you can see in the figure. Uh, in particular, he has found that HK, that segment that you can uh, point out in the figure is to, Kn as Mo is to Op. Okay, can you see uh, the segments? Okay, okay. Now he also he also adds the following consideration, and this is something that he has already found uh, uh, in another part of the treatise on the equilibrium of planes. But again, here we are in the method, okay? Yeah, this is proposition one of the method. So it says that point one, point N, sorry, is the center of gravity of the straight line MO. Why? Because 
he already knows that the center of gravity of a straight line is the middle point, and n is the middle point of MO. Now, here comes the magic, the first act of magic. Uh, Archimedes says that we can take the segments PO, make a duplicate of that segment, and we can place that segment in age, in point age. And I have to say that the distance HK is equal to the distance KC, okay? The segment uh, uh, KH or HK has been constructed uh, as to be equal to the segment KC. So he's taking this uh, PO, is making a duplicate of that segment and he literally says, well, I will put that segment in age. Age is the middle point of TL, which is our duplicate of PO. So take PO, you make a duplicate of that segment and you put the segment in age, okay? Now, we add, uh, we add this proportion uh, HK is to KN as MO is to LT, uh, MO, sorry, is to PO. Now, we can consider the, uh, the new uh, scenario that we have uh, uh, built, okay? With LT equal to PO, in age, in point H. Now, in, the, in this uh, diagram, uh, I have uh, colored uh, these lines just to, uh, just to show you that what Archimedes has, uh, uh, has uh, uh, constructed is a balance, is a lever, a fulcrum K. Actually, the proportion, the proportion that he has found and you can read the proportion in the following way because PO is equal to TL. So HK is to KN as MO is to LT. This is the law of the lever. So this proportion means that, that HK and KN are our distances from the fulcrum K and TL and MO are our weights on the balance. Can you see that? Okay, good. But if this proportion holds, then, then TL is in equilibrium with MO. They are at equilibrium, right? Let's uh, let's make a step further here. The same, the very, very same argument for PO, which is to, you take PO and you place that segment in H, can be made for all, all the lines inside the parabolic segment. Sorry. And you can see these lines in uh, the first figure on the left, okay? So the parabolic segment is made by all these parallel green lines, okay? Inside it, of course. So you can take all these lines and you can put them in H as we did for PO. But of course, Archimedes also observes the following uh, fact, which is the triangle AZC, the big triangle there, is also made up by what? By all the lines parallel, the violet lines in my, in my diagram. And so you can consider that all these lines, they give you the triangle, okay? 
A further uh, observation here, uh, again, I'm not giving you the, the mathemat mathematical details, but this is something that he has already, already proven in uh, another part of uh, uh, on the equilibrium of planes. Archimedes says, well, uh, I consider the triangle AZC, and I know that point X is the center of gravity of this triangle. And you can find this point by tracing uh, the uh, medians, sorry, medians, Fernando is that medians, the, by, by taking the middle point of all the sides and tracing <laughs> from all the vertices, the lines from the vertices to the opposite uh, uh, middle point of the, uh, from the vertex, from one vertex uh, to the uh, middle point of the opposite sides, uh, side. So uh, what Archimedes is doing here is, is waiting, waiting the parabolic segments and the triangle, the big triangle AZC. And he is saying that they balance, they balance because we know that if the proportion holds, then they are at equilibrium, okay? And the proportion in question is triangle AZC is to the parabolic segment as HK, which is the first distance from the fulcrum, is to KX, okay? We are taking all these lines for the parabolic segment, but also for the triangle. And we are weighting the figures, okay? So final slide about Archimedes. Uh, we have this, uh, this uh, uh, proportion, uh, the triangle AZC is to the parabolic segment as HK is to KX. Uh, now we also know uh, that uh, HK is three times kx. So we can substitute uh, uh, three uh, kx uh, uh, in the proportion. And what we get uh, is the following relation, which is one here, yeah, equation one. The triangle, the big triangle AZC is three times the parabolic segment. You can, you can see mm, that uh, just by looking at the proportion. Triangle AZ, AZC is to the parabolic segment as three KX is to KX. So you can simplify, blah, 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 et cetera. But we also know, and here uh, uh, Archimedes is, is using the elements, Euclid's elements, that the, this big triangle AZC is four times uh, the triangle ABC for some reasons uh, that come from Euclid's elements that we are not interested here. So you can combine these two results and you get uh, your proposition, which is the parab parabolic segment is four thirds of, uh, four thirds, sorry, the triangle ABC. Okay, which is uh, again uh, our the proposition uh, with with uh, we start. Okay, now a second example which is uh, uh, not so sophisticated, let's say, and uh, which is also very provocative. Uh, at least I take this um, as very provocative. Now consider this uh, uh, arithmetic proposition. This uh, sorry, this proposition in number theory. Uh, the arithmetic mean, uh, which is the quantity on the left for two terms, is greater than or equal to the harmonic mean. This is a, a, an inequality in number theory. Okay. Now let's let's go to to the physical part. Uh, we consider this circuit. In figure, uh, we have uh, some resistors uh, of resistances R1 and R2, okay? And we also have this switch between nodes E and F. And we can consider uh, the total resistance 
when the switch is open and when the switch is closed. Okay, so we have two configurations for the CFU. In the first configuration, the switch between E and F, the nodes, is open. And in this case, we have two paths in parallel, okay, which have uh, resistances R1 plus R2. We can calculate the total resistance uh, uh, between uh, the nodes A and B and the total resistance, uh, it will be given by the famous formula for the resistance uh, uh, for a series, uh, the total resistance for a, a, a series of resistances, okay, uh, which uses these reciprocals, okay. So the total resistance in configuration one is R1 plus R2 over two, okay, this is the, uh, the final result. Second configuration, we close the switch, okay? So you can see in figure that the switch now is closed, okay? So in this case, we have two resistors in parallel. We calculate the, the two uh, resistances of these resistors. And, and after that, we get the total resistance by considering that these uh, are, uh, are in parallel. And in this case, we have to sum the individual resistances. So we get this result, which is to uh, total resistance of this circuit in configuration two is uh, two, uh, two uh, R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. Now, we uh, we are almost done why because we can observe that when we close the switch what we have is a, a higher current uh, in the circuit and and a resistance which is lower okay so when we short the circuit uh, we get uh, Total resistance, which is the same as or less than the total resistance of the circuit in the open configuration. And of course, we already know what the total resistance is in the first configuration, but also in the second configuration. So we can express this inequality following way, the first equation here and if you want to replace R1 with R2, uh, uh, um, R1 and R2 with A and B, well, you will see how this formula is identical to the formula uh, that we started with. Uh, and uh, it's, it is our proposition. The arithmetic mean, this quantity on the left, is greater than or equal to the harmonic mean, okay? And of course, you can generalize this. I, I, have, I have just given you uh, the case for two resistances and two real numbers in the formula, but you can get a lot of, uh, uh, you can duplicate this configuration of the circuit and you can get general formula, okay? So not only for A and B, but for N elements uh, and uh, uh, real numbers, okay? This would be the, the um, of course, the general form of the uh, inequality. Now, um, let me uh, let me come back to the uh, to the more theoretical or philosophical, let's say, part of the presentation. Now, uh, first of all, let me say something about the evaluation of the uh, of the uh, direct applications. Okay. Now we say that. Uh, mathematics successfully applies in science when, well, of course, we need a criterion to say that. Uh, we cannot evaluate the success of mathematics in, uh, for instance, physics, just by looking at how mathematics is applied in physics. We want an external criterion. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, if we do not have an external criterion, the reasoning would be circular, okay? 
you, you would say that, yes, you have a successful application because you have a successful application in mathematics. But I want, I want to say more on that. I want to give a criterion to say that this particular application is successful. And of course, in the case of direct applications, even in, if in the debate, this criterion has not been explicitly proposed, the criterion is the following one. The success of mathematics in the empirical sciences is given by the fact that the results that we get through mathematics receive what? Successful confirmations from an empirical point of view, or they allow to make successful empirical predictions. Okay, this is not very original. But let's consider the success of converse applications, which is something that should be explored too. Now, in the case of uh, converse applications, again, the criterion should be somehow external to the application themselves, okay? So I propose the following idea, which is the success of non-mathematical methods in mathematics is given from what? From the existence of a purely mathematical proof of the result. So if you have a purely mathematical proof of Archimedes proposition one, a proof that is given in pure mathematics, okay, you get that result. And in that case, well, you can say that the application of the law of the lever in mathematics is successful, okay? So this, this would be a, a way to evaluate the success of uh, non-mathematical methods in mathematics, okay? And let's see how this work uh, in, in the case of our examples, okay? Now, first of all, in Archimedes case, well, actually, uh, it is uh, it is Archimedes himself uh, who uh, uh, tells us that there is a purely mathematical proof of the result. This purely mathematical proof uh, is given by Archimedes in another treatise, another very important very important treatise, which is the Quadrature of, of the Parabola, and in that treatise, Archimedes does not use the law, the lever, or mechanical considerations to prove the very same result. And I'm quoting here uh, Archimedes from this particular uh, edition. Uh, this has not therefore, therefore sorry, been proved by the above, which is the mathematical uh, treatments uh, given by Archimedes. We only saw one part of it. But the certain impression that has been created that the conclusion is true. So impression that the conclusion is true. We are not proving the result. We are creating the impression that the conclusion is true. Since we thus see that the conclusion has not been proved, but we suppose it is true, we shall mention the previously published ge geometrical proof, which we ourselves have found for it in its appointed place, which is the quadrature of the parabola, a purely mathematical proof of the very same result. Now, in the circuit example, we can make the same uh, test. We can check if we have a purely mathematical proof, uh, proof sorry, of this result. And of course, as many of you uh, know, uh, we can prove uh, the, uh, the inequality in pure mathematics, okay? So we have not, not only one, we have uh, uh, several ways to, to prove that uh, uh, result in pure mathematics, okay? Now, uh, of course, we have, uh, we have given uh, these criteria for success, but uh, uh, we also want to know uh, how how uh, these converse applications work, okay? Now, uh, uh, I argue that uh, what is applied in uh, some converse applications, as for instance, uh, in uh, the examples that we have seen uh, so far, are not 
are not, and this may be trivial, but I, I, I have to say that, are not uh, uh, entities from the empirical sciences, but, but uh, principles, and in particular, conservation principles that are fundamental to uh, physics and uh, uh, also to uh, other natural sciences. Okay, so what is applied in these examples, what is successfully applied in these examples are conservation principles. And uh, uh, please note that I'm using principles, not laws. Sometimes uh, uh, not only physicists, but also philosophers, they use, uh, uh, they conflate the two. So they use the same terminology, conservation laws, conservation principles, no. I take, uh, um, I, I take uh, for instance, the principle of conservation uh, of energy uh, as a conservation principle, because this is more fundamental than uh, some other laws, okay? That's why it is a principle uh, in physics, okay? Now, uh, let's see what this means very shortly in, uh, in our cases. Well, actually, if you take the law of the lever, you can get this law from what? From conservation of energy. And this is a quotation from uh, uh, Richard Feynman uh, uh, book, uh, this seven, uh, seven, uh, 67 book uh, um, in which he discusses how uh, conservation principles are fundamental in physics. And he makes this, uh, he gives this example of the, of the law of the lever, okay? And actually, he also shows how to get the law of the lever from, <clears throat> from conservation of energy, okay? So uh, in the case of Archimedes, uh, uh, geometrical treatment and uh, uh, use of uh, law of the lever, what is applied in that particular case is not, are not levers or uh, weights or uh, uh, empirical entities or et cetera, concrete entities, et cetera, especially because these entities are idealized, okay? We are taking into consideration idealization, idealizations of concrete entities. The lever is uh, weightless, okay? Uh, the, uh, the masses uh, are homogeneous and weightless too. So uh, these idealization, they do not correspond to concrete entities, okay? So what we are applying there, I claim, is, is a conservation principle. It is the principle of conservation of energy. So we want to, uh, uh, we have to account for the uh, success of the empirical sciences uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, at least one set of converse, uh, uh, converse uh, applications uh, if we, uh, uh, in terms of the successful application of conservation principles. And this is something that uh, you can also see from uh, my second ex example, the circuit example. In the circuit example, uh, um, if, you, uh, if you remember, we, uh, first of all, we calculated the total resistances for both configurations, okay? Configuration one, switch open, configuration two, switch close. So in that case, in that case, we used the uh, famous, uh, famous formulas for the uh, resistances in series and in parallel. And actually what, uh, uh, what we know from physics is that these formulas, we get these formulas from these Kirchhoff laws. Kirchhoff's laws, uh, the first one, uh, the, the, the first uh, law by Kirchhoff states that the sum of currents entering one node is equal to the sum of currents that exit from uh, that node. The second one states that the algebraic sum, okay, of all voltages uh, within any closed path of a circuit must, must be equal to zero. But these, these laws can be restated 
in terms of conservation of electric charge and conservation of energy for an ideal circuit. Again, this is an idealized, idealized situation, okay? So even in this, in this case, the problem of the successful application of physics in mathematics can be restated in terms of the successful application of conservation principles in mathematics. So we are moving from uh, application of entities, which is not correct because we are not applying uh, entities like levers, et cetera, in mathematics to a view which is focused on conservation principles. That is what is applied at least in these, uh, uh, in these uh, examples, okay? And also in other examples that I have found in the literature. Now, there is, there is the interesting question, uh, which is the problem, uh, the, uh, the converse uh, applicability problem. How can we account for the effectiveness of conservation principles in mathematics? And then here uh, I have in mind three. Uh, I, I have in mind uh, three proposals. Okay, that can be developed. Uh, this is the, the this is the uh, the last part uh, of my uh, of my uh, research, and this is something that I'm trying to develop. Um, so first of all, we may think that conservation principles and mathematical truth, they successfully interact, okay? Because they have the same degree of necessity. So this uh, proposal would be based on a degree view of necessity, okay? So there is this particular fit in terms of degrees of necessities of what? Of mathematical truths, and conservation principles. And the idea uh, here comes from, uh, from uh, uh, Mark Lane's work on, on uh, mathematical expansion in science. Actually, he tries to develop this view, uh, this view of mathematical explanation in science, uh, which is uh, founded, which is based on the degree of necessity of the uh, mathematical propositions that are applied in uh, the empirical sciences, okay? So we have this uh, uh, notion of uh, uh, mathematical explanation that, is, uh, that draws on the degree of necessity of the uh, propositions that are involved in the explanation. And Lange says that mathematical truths have a stronger degree of necessity, and that is why they can explain in physics stronger than uh, physical laws, the stronger, sorry, than the degree of necessity of physical laws. A second proposal here um, is to uh, consider that conservation principles and mathematical truths, they successfully interact because they share this same status of being metaphysically necessary. So they are both for metaphysical necessities. And this status of being both metaphysically necessary is what would, uh, would make uh, the uh, fit optimal, okay? So we are considering the same kinds of necessities, this is uh, uh, not a species, uh, sorry, this is not a degree view, this is a species view of necessity. So they interact in a successful way because uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are both metaphysically necessary, okay? Uh, probably you have, uh, uh, you have uh, um, probably you know that uh, uh, scientific essentialists they consider uh, conservation laws, not only conservation laws actually, uh, laws uh, uh, in general, natural laws as, as uh, 
uh, necessary from a meta metaphysical point of view. Okay, so here I, I am I am trying to uh, to take this uh, idea from them and see how it can be developed in uh, this particular context. Uh, a third proposal would be to, uh, to explore the idea that conservation principles are mathematical. They, uh, they are mathematical because, because they come from theorems, mathematical theorems, and in particular, they come from uh, nether theorems. So they are essentially, Joao says, yes, yes, yeah, that, that's the way. <laughs> So these conservation principles are mathematical. So um, in one sense, uh, this proposal is compatible with uh, uh, number two because, uh, uh, the, uh, because we are uh, taking uh, a conservation principle as having the same uh, status, uh, the same necessary status of mathematical truth. Okay, the, the, we are talking about mathematics. But of course, if we follow this path, okay, at the end, there won't be a converse problem because we are applying mathematics to mathematics. We are applying conservation principles, which are mathematical, if we follow this third path to mathematics. So there is no converse applicability, applicability problem to start with. Okay, and uh, yes, uh, so a, a brief, uh, very short uh, recap on what I, I tried to uh, argue. First of all, that the, the, there are, there also exist converse applications in mathematical practice um, that the study uh, of uh, the general problem of applicability uh, must take into account uh, these converse applications, okay? Uh, I've given you a, a criterion to, uh, to evaluate the success of converse applications, an explicit criterion. Uh, I claim that some, some converse applications essentially depend on the use of conservation principles in mathematics. And I also, uh, I've also given you uh, three proposals, okay? I have sketched these proposals. And these proposals, uh, they, they, they should provide uh, a way to, uh, to uh, answer the question, how do conservation principles uh, successfully apply in, uh, in mathematics, okay? And of course, you can find more directions for future work. Uh, well, of course, uh, investigation of how uh, other empirical sciences besides physics can be applied in mathematics. Actually, uh, recently, uh, uh, I, um, I, I had uh, a conversation with Anna Simoes. And Anna uh, told me uh, that uh, uh, there is there is a, a literature uh, on uh, on the use of uh, uh, chemistry in mathematics. There is also a special issue of the journal Heil devoted to that particular topic. So I'm starting to exploring also these uh, these uh, topics uh, besides physics. Okay, other empirical sciences. Uh, not only nat natural sciences, you, can, you may also think that uh, uh, social sciences have uh, some applications in mathematics. But this is something that, of course, should be developed. Uh, another, another important uh, uh, point for, uh, for my work uh, is to uh, pick up some traditions in the history of science, history of mathematics, in which, in which there is an application of, uh, um, of considerations from the empirical sciences in mathematics. And of course, I'm not talking about uh, applications of instruments, because if, you, if we consider applications 
or of mechanical instruments in mathematics, of course, we can also go, uh, uh, we can also trace the origins of this problem to Babylonian algebra or Egyptian uh, mathematics, et cetera, et cetera. I'm considering uh, theoretical considerations from uh, the side of the empirical sciences as applied in mathematics. And there is, uh, uh, I have discovered very recently, uh, actually Gabriele uh, Lolli, the mathematician, also historian, math historian of mathematics, suggests me to look at this Russian tradition. And actually, uh, Mark Levi is part of that tradition, okay? Exploring further the three accounts that I have just sketched here, so an exploration of these accounts and also explore further connections between this uh, converse applicability problem and other issues in uh, uh, general philosophy of science and philosophy of mathematics. For instance, the case of mathematical explanation in science, it is well known that successful applicability of mathematics in science is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for uh, explanatory power of mathematics in science. So explore further the connections between the general problem of applicability and the issue of explanation in science. And of course, uh, you can uh, you may say that there are connections between what between the direct and the converse applicability problems. Okay, so explore further these kind of connections. Okay, in order to see if we are talking of the very same problem. Okay, or or if these problems, the direct and the converse problem, should be kept distinct. Okay. The, they are essentially these things. And this is something that, of course, is still in progress. And thank you.